Good morning. Um, as we are now admitting our attendees, let me welcome everyone who is uh, joining and watching us. We are back at the webinar series of the Fruit Flies in Silico Prevention Management Project under the Horizon 2020 European Funding for Research and Innovation. Uh, as we are progressing to the implementation of our project, we want to share and communicate our results and outputs. Uh, so today we will focus on uh, nematodes for off-season uh, control of the Mediterranean fruit fly. Uh, one or two technical uh, details about today's webinar. Please note that uh, our webinar is being recorded as we want to have it uh, for dissemination and communication purposes of our project. And um, please uh, be aware that after the presentation, we will have uh, some time for your questions. So please leave uh, any questions at, uh, using the Q&A button that you will find uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will uh, share them to our presenter. Uh, I don't want to uh, lose uh, more time. I would like us to start. I will ask our moderator uh, and project coordinator, Professor Papadopoulos uh, of the Department of Agriculture, Crop Production and Rural Environment of University of Thessaly uh, to briefly introduce us uh, to today's uh, topic and to our speaker, Dr. Arne Peters. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Georgia, for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm really glad today to introduce uh, Dr. Arne Peters, who is uh, leading the research uh, and development team at the INEMA. INEMA is a company specialized in endomopathogenic nematodes and biological control. So Arne has uh, a long history in endomopathogenic nematodes. He started in 1990s and was uh, a founder, one of the founders of the company INEMA in 1997. So besides uh, all the supervising activities, is uh, leading uh, the process and development team. He has uh, collaborated with uh, other scientists. Uh, one of them is Apostolos Kapranas. He was formerly in the Benaiki Phytopathological Institute on addressing and controlling uh, other pests uh, such as the large uh, pine uh, weevil, the Hilobius uh, abietis, of course, with uh, nematodes. So we are happy to have uh, Arne and Inema on board uh, on the FFIPM program. Uh, it's uh, really a challenging effort to develop off-season biological control for the Mediterranean fruit fly and other invasive fruit flies as well. So this uh, off-season approach in managing fruit flies is uh, a central concept in our project. And um, as a coordinator and uh, all the partners, I think we are really happy to see that uh, we have uh, developed tools that can support this concept. So uh, we are, I'm looking forward as uh, all of uh, the attendees to the talk of Arne. So Arne, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Nicolas, for this introduction to my company. I will just share the screen now. And start my presentation. I think you can all see the um, presentation now. So I will start um, uh, with my topic, nematodes for off-season control of the Mediterranean fruit fly and and uh, I will actually because I'm not sure how, how familiar everyone in the audience is with nematodes give an introduction to entomopathogenic nematodes first uh, also tell something about the mass production uh, how that does that work and then um, I will spend some time on ways to apply nematodes for insect control because I believe that there is a lot of room to widen the um, nematode use by uh, well, suitable and clever uh, application methods. And then I will come to the trials to control Mediterranean fruit flies, which were carried out within uh, during the time of this project in the lab and in the field, um, and conclude with the current recommendations for using nematodes for the off-season control of Mediterranean fruit flies. 
Okay, so what are nematodes? Well, you're probably aware, at least if you're a zoologist, biologist, nematodes is a very important class in the animal kingdom. It's uh, supposed to be the richest in uh, terms of individuals in from all the animals. Um, and there are a lot of free living forms mainly, but also quite a few parasitic forms there, which either um, are parasites of plants, of humans, of livestock, of pets as well, and of insects. I mean, that's where we come in. Uh, there are insect parasitic nematodes. The most well known are the mermetids. So uh, those are nematodes which are really parasites in the classical sense that they do not kill the host uh, until uh, very late. Um, so they are not ideal candidates for biocontrol. Um, but uh, the nematodes we are working with, the so-called entomopathogenic nematodes, or pathogenic rather than parasitic, um, they are killing the insect within a quite short time. And I will uh, come to the details now why they are able to do so. So as entomopathogenic nematodes, they are sympathetically associated with entomopathogenic bacteria. So basically uh, the nematodes are bacteria feeders and there are a wide range of bacteria feeders among the nematode species. And um, it's easily uh, conceivable that they have at some point in the evolution encountered uh, insect pathogenic bacteria, which uh, has given them an enormous uh, advantage. And uh, as the evolution was going on, they um, developed a quite close association with these antimopathogenic bacteria. Um, they kill the insects within 24 to 48 hours post-infection. And inside the insect, they actually feed on bacteria rather than on uh, insect um, tissue. So here you can see a picture of the um, bacteria inside an infective juvenile. They are uh, in some species, they are uh, actually enclosed in such a pouch here in the intestine. Otherwise the um, infective juvenile is not feeding, they are living uh, in the soil and waiting for insect hosts and also actively seeking the insect host. And once they have reached them, they will actually release these uh, symbiotic bacteria. So <clears throat> I go to the life cycle. Uh, it's a rather simple life cycle. Basically the infective juveniles, they are in the soil and they enter the insect host. Then they release the symbiotic bacteria and develop to adults. The insect dies and um, the nematodes proliferate and they feed on the bacteria which are um, actually digesting the insect tissue. And after a while, depending on the size of the insect, it's one generation or more generations of nematode cycles. The infective juveniles emerge from the host cadaver, uh, from the depleted host cadaver, and then they are ready to are uh, find and infest new uh, insect hosts. So if you look at the single step of this life cycle, the um, well, most interesting in terms of biocontrol is obviously uh, how do the nematodes encounter the insects and they have uh, different ways of doing so. So uh, for instance, this Tanonima capu capsa, especially they, they, one of the species that has its, its habit to stand on its tail and to um, protrude its body. And by doing so, it's waiting for insects passing by. And um, if an insect passes by here, it sticks to the insect and can then look for the um, entry points. So, but they also move through the soil and um, there are a number of cues which they use to find the insect. Noise has been identified. So the, the noise the insect is doing while it's chewing on the uh, roots, the movement of the insect um, itself. Um, so the, the mechanical um, vibrations, 
Then there are a chemical cues from the insect or from the injure, injured uh, roots the feeding is the insect is feeding on, and then carbon dioxide. This is all for insect larvae in the soil. Obviously, for um, insect larvae um, on the leaves, uh, that's a bit different. But for Mediterranean fruit flies, who are, for instance, feeding inside a fruit, um, some of these cues are also important cues for the nematodes to locate and find the insect larvae. The nematodes can move in galleries if the galleries are small enough, and they can also move inside the fruits, which is very important because the, the larva has obviously left a gallery which the nematode can follow to find the larva. Once the nematode has reached the uh, insect, it can penetrate inside the body and it actually must reach the insect's hemocell before it can release the bacteria. There's no sense of releasing bacteria inside the intestine of the insect, for instance. And um, while they do enter through natural openings like the mouth, the anus, or the spiracles, but they can also enter directly through the skin if the skin is not too thick and if the skin is not covered with a, a wax layer. Um, so that's also happening. I have a short movie, which I will probably play accelerated now, which um, shows the infection of a uh, different larva, a beetle larva, the Western corn rootworm. Uh, there we have actually um, made a movie of how the infection is going on. So I will comment while it's running. I hope you can see it. Um, you just saw the larva on the ground moving and waving. And these uh, nematode larvae, they infect the insects. And they have actually already entered here the insect, which has died. And you can see, if you look very closely, the nematodes moving inside the insect. Here you can see it better. So the insect is already dead. The bacteria has been um, released. You can see the nematodes moving inside the dead, dead insect. I think there's another picture where such an, uh, yeah, here where such an insect has been squeezed under the microscope. And then, yeah, the nematodes um, obviously are squeezed out. You can see that these nematodes have already uh, started feeding. Well, you can probably not see it, but uh, I, I can see it because they look a bit different from um, infective juveniles. And if the time proceeds, uh, these nematodes grow and um, the insect carcass at the end is filled with nematodes. And also with some of the species, um, a color is produced. Those are the symbiotic bacteria here producing a red color. So it's easily recognized Bill, if a nematode uh, is infecting some uh, insects by the red color. Yes, and after a while, you see the very big adults inside the insect. And these adults carry, well, hundreds of eggs inside. Here you can see these small round bubbles. Those are the eggs. Um, nematodes can release the insect at this point. Usually they um, stay inside the insect until the uh, infective juveniles have been developed. So I will jump through this and show you one of these females um, with all the eggs inside. So it's filled with the nematode eggs. And as I said, in one generation, we have a multiplication of more than 100 fold. Um, and the proliferation and the growth of these eggs and the hatching of the eggs is so quick uh, that the um, mother actually has no time to release all the eggs. So the nematodes start feeding inside the mother body. So um, basically it's also consuming the, the tissue of uh, the mother, and at the end, um, all the infective juveniles are released from the mother insect. 
So those are already infected juveniles. They are very dark because they are full of uh, lipid, which serves as an energy source for the well unknown time which they will need in the soil to find an insect. They can survive in the soil with these lipid reserves for six months, depending on the soil temperature, uh, also one year. Um, and they, while they are in the soil, they do not feed. So they, they cannot uh, take up any nourishment inside the soil. soil. And here is one of the um, Dibrotica larva filled with all these infective juveniles. Out of such an insect, uh, we get about 100,000 infective juveniles hatching, and it's enough if two or three nematodes infect these insects. So through multiple generations, you can have uh, an enormous reproduction. OK, I hope you enjoyed this video, <laughs> although it's lunchtime. Um, and um, I will now shortly show what do we do in mask uh, production. We could, for one, um, produce them in insects. And that's actually still done in some regions of the world, since uh, the insects were are um, also, they, they reproduce very well in insects. But obviously, insect rearing itself is uh, an expensive and labor in intensive task. So we do it in vitro um, in liquid culture. And to do so, we pick nematodes from the soil samples. This is an infective juveniles with the bacteria inside. And these infective juveniles are then infested to insects. Um, and the bacteria are released. The insect in the beginning is still alive, which is good because then the active immune response of the insect is actually removing uh, all the other bacteria which inevitably come into the insect up, uh, during the penetration process. So we can quite easily pick the symbiotic bacteria from a freshly infected insect and isolate it on an agar plate. It's more difficult to get sterile nematodes because we have to wait there until the, the insect um, is dead and until the nematode has actually developed eggs. And these eggs need to be surface sterilized because at this point of time, the insect is already uh, quite decomposed and the intestine uh, tissue is open. So there are a lot of other bacteria in the carcass. So we do uh, get out the eggs from the females and then we incubate the eggs in uh, nutrient broth for a while just to check. Well, no, first of all, we surface sterilize the eggs and then we put them into nutrient broth to check whether the eggs are really sterile. And then if the um, eggs are sterile and the young nematodes have hatched, we quickly have to combine the nematodes and the bacteria. The nematodes without the bacteria will not survive uh, for more than a few days. So we have to immediately um, combine the bacteria with the insect, uh, with, the, with the bacteria, so the nematodes with the bacteria, and then we can go on. So this monoxenic culture on the agar plate is basically our starter to uh, run all the mass production. So from this, um, Agar plate, we can go into shaken flask, it's standard microbiology, and then into vessels which are 10 liter, 150 liter, 3000 liter. This is a rather old slide. We, we now have actually um, tanks which are 100,000 liter, and we can produce nematodes in, in that volume. And it's important to notice that all this here is actually a sterile. Um, environment. So in, in all these tanks, we have only the nematode and its symbiotic bacteria, which is very crucial for the success of the mass culture. So how do we actually uh, um, do the mass production? Is uh, we, we have a pre-culture of the bacteria, which is a bit different from what is happening 
inside the insect. As I said, in the, in, in the insect, the nematode goes inside and then starts to develop and uh, releases the bacteria. Well, this initial signal for development um, is not easy to uh, copy or to create artificially because you would need uh, some insect blood. Uh, it's very difficult to have this um, food signal for development. But luckily, there's a second food signal which is produced by the bacteria culture. So we do a pre-culture of the bacteria, of the symbiotic bacteria for one to two days. And then we add the um, monoxenic nematodes to this culture. And these bacteria produce a signal which makes the nematode enter the development. Those nematodes start feeding here and they start development to adults. So in this, this first step, is uh, very important we, and we spend quite a lot of time to optimize this um, onset of the development of the nematodes by uh, steering the bacteria pre-culture. So once the nematodes have developed, they will then uh, either produce males and females in Steinonema, and these males and females have to mate, and then they will produce eggs. In heteropletus, in the first generation, we only have um, well, female phenotypes, but these females are also producing sperms. So those are automatic uh, females, which is very important for being successful in liquid culture. So I will show in the next slide. So we have males and females in Stanonema and hermaphrodites here in the uh, genus heteroraptitis. And those, by the way, are the only two genera which are produced nowadays as biocontrol uh, agents. Uh, so why is it important that we have automatic females for heteroraptitis? They have in the set second generation also males and females, but the way they mate is so delicate that it does not work in liquid culture. You can see it here. The male uh, only adheres to the female here at the end where the, um, the female, the, the vagina of the female is. And um, this is not possible in liquid culture. The male has not a chance to um, look for this uh, place. While in Stadionema, the male is coiling around the female and then it is all the time to find the proper space. And this is also possible in liquid culture. That was a very important finding uh, for us because um, other companies have started with producing Steinonema. So they thought, well, it's no problem for uh, nematodes to mate in liquid culture. But we started with heteropitis and then we saw there are some problems with uh, working with males and females. So we need to have uh, the automatic uh, females which produce their own sp uh, sperms in liquid culture. Okay, um, with all this introduction, I will come to the uh, advantages and limits of entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, they have a very wide host range, actually. Uh, insects are infested, but, uh, and they have also a reasonably high efficacy. They have the possibility to move in the soil and to search for uh, insects. It's limited as we will see later, but they, they can actually move, which is quite uh, unique in biocontrol agents. And they can be produced in vitro, which is due to their um, the symbiosis with the bacteria. And they can be also be applied with existing um, application technology. So with normal um, sprayers, because the infective juveniles are very small, they are only about half a millimeter long, and they will pass through standard agricultural nozzles. The drawbacks of this agent is that they have a very short shelf life, um, and they need moist conditions. And as a result, they are actually quite expensive because they cannot be uh, stocked um, or stored for a long time. And also the logistics 
are a bit complicated because of the moist conditions and the cooling needed during transport. Okay, what are the main nematode markets today? Uh, just very quickly, one very important market is uh, scarred flies. The larvae are infested by nematodes. The larvae do cause problems in seeding and um, cutting cultures and in mushrooms. The mushroom is a very important uh, market for us uh, because these insects are a big problem there and um, they can be nicely controlled with nematodes. And uh, obviously the, the use of nematodes has become very important because non-chemical solutions uh, have um, been fostered by the consumer's requirement. But in some uh, uh, cases, there are also no chemical alternatives available anymore. As with this insect, the black vine weevil, that's a soil living insect, at least the larva is living in the soil, and there's no way to control it chemically right now. So you can either dip your um, seedlings in a solution with nematodes before you plant them out, or you can spray them. Um, you can also apply the nematodes with the drip irrigation and then control here the nematode in rhododendron or in soft fruit here, so strawberries. Another very important market are scarabid larvae, which are living in grassland mainly, can also be nicely controlled with nematodes. In the forest, uh, Nicolas was already mentioning this, there's this pest here, the Alluvius abietis, large pine weevil, can also be controlled with nematodes. It's a bit uh, cumbersome to do so because you have to uh, get a lot of water into the uh, forest and apply it directly to the stumps, but it's being done in Scotland and also in parts of uh, Northern England and Ireland. Then we come to orchards, which are more close to uh, um, the Mediterranean fruit fly. Uh, here we can either control the flat-headed root borer, Capnodus tenebrionis, in the soil, um, but here also you have to find ways of uh, injecting the nematodes to the soil. And then uh, once it's uh, near the roots, it will find the galleries of the uh, Capnodis larva and then follow them and kill the larva. Um, the codling moth in a way is actually very similar to the Mediterranean fruit fly because in the winter it also uh, spends a long time um, in the larval stage, which is always good for a nematode treatment. So we uh, do apply uh, nematodes against the codling moth uh, in late autumn or early spring. And then the nematodes um, are hitting the bark where the codling moths do actually um, hide. And then they find the galleries and um, go inside the cotling moth and you can slowly kill them. Obviously, you need a nematode here, which is active at reasonably cold temperatures. And we have Stananema felt here, which works down to eight degrees. And that's in many regions where apple is grown, um, absolutely sufficient to control cotling or larvae in the winter. There are a number of other orchard tests which can be applied with uh, or treated with nematodes. Here's a list of them. Um, not all of them are uh, in Europe. Guava weevil, for instance, that's more in Brazil, um, the pest. Um, another important pest, which is well known in Greece, I think, is the palm weevil, Richophos ferrigineus. It can be uh, applied or treated with Stanima carpo capsa. And here, interestingly, the, the adult is also quite susceptible. The problem or the challenge here is to get the nematodes where the palm weevil is. So you have to apply the nematodes with quite a lot of water into onto the top of the palms. You can also um, well, install a, a line where you can inject nematodes here and uh, they are then dripped up in the, into the palms. 
And then they will dribble down and move down in the trunk and find the uh, weevils and the larvae. These are infested larvae um, because they turn uh, orange. But even in broad acre crops, we have developed methods to treat uh, the insect pests with nematodes. The movie I was showing was about the Western corn rootworm in uh, maize. And um, well, obviously maize is not a very high value crop. So we had to reduce the dosage in order to be compatible with other treatments and to make it valuable to, to do a biological treatment against this pest. So we have a row application with um, 200 liter of water uh, with a special device here where the nematodes are actually uh, sewn together with the, the corn, which means that the nematode activity must be maintained over about uh, two months. And we have actually uh, genetically improved our isolate um, to be more persistent. And uh, we now know that this method is, is working perfectly. The nematodes can survive sufficiently long to later on attack the larvae when they are hatching. Interesting devices are uh, always developed for these nematodes. Not all of them uh, have reached uh, the, the big market. But one of these devices I want to show here, it's, it's against termites. Where, where the you, you put this actually into the soil and the producer has um, actually developed here such a monitoring um, window where you can see whether the uh, termites have entered this device or not, because if they have entered, they will chew on the cardboard and then here this uh, window will change appearance. And then you know uh, you can apply nematodes because you know there are termites inside and you would pour the nematodes here in the center. I'm not sure how much this device is used in the US. Um, in Germany, obviously, there are not many termites. Uh, so we, we, are, we have limited possibilities to develop this method further in Europe. What we did so develop is a method to uh, treat adult um, insects. In this case, uh, it's a device to treat adult vine weevils because they have the habit to hide underneath um, wooden pieces or stones during the daytime. We simply um, developed a, a formulation where we put nematodes in a moist um, gel where they can survive for a long time. And we put this device here in these grooves of a wooden piece and put that on the soil. And the nematodes will then crawl underneath um, this piece of wood. And the nematodes have uh, enough time to enter uh, the insects. They, and they can actually enter from the top, which means that they usually crawl underneath the elytra of the insects, where the surface is quite, or the cuticle of the insect is quite soft, and they can then enter to the hemisphere. A very similar device we've developed for an, an arthropod, which is actually not, not very susceptible to nematodes, wood lice. Um, but if you apply a sufficiently high dose, you can even kill this insect. And we apply this high dose by um, attracting the wood lice to bait stations here with uh, some fallen leaves from our beech trees. Uh, which are infested with a nematode mixture of quite high concentration. So the um, wood lice go into, inside this device, feed on the leaves, and um, the nematodes have enough time to enter the wood lice. They will actually not develop inside the wood lice because it's not a suitable host, but they will kill them. Okay, that was a quick ride through the current status of um, nematode, entomopathogenic nematode science or application more. Um, they are also very interesting to uh, models for fundamental science. Um, 
Within the FFIPM project, um, the objective was to develop a nematode-based control tool for the off-season control of the uh, insects. And one of the activities was developing a mulch formulation, very similar to what I've just shown. Um, uh, it's either, either a wood mulch or a leaf mulch with a high concentration of uh, nematodes inside. And the idea was uh, maybe when the flies emerge from the soil, they have to move through this uh, mulch layer and they encounter uh, these nematodes in the mulch layer and um, then the, the nematodes will actually infest the adult flies. So that was one um, um, topic, one task which we made. We tried to develop such a mulch formulation. Besides, uh, laboratory tests were done to find the most uh, suitable nematode strain or yeah, commercial strain for uh, mat fly control. Uh, to control the major larvae in the soil substrate and most important also in the infested fruits. Um, the nematodes were applied to soil substrate and then the larvae were added um, and the fruits infested were placed on top of the EPA in substrate, very much like in the open field. And the efficacy was always assessed by counting the emerging uh, fruit flies after four to six weeks. <clears throat> and in the end, um, there was also a field testing done to check the performance of the most suitable nematode species in the um, established concentration. So let's start with the mulch formulation. Uh, I showed that picture initially. Um, the mulch formulation is actually a, a super adsorbent gel to uh, provide the moisture and um, a mixture. Oh, there's also sand in, mixed into this because in the gel itself, the, the nematodes cannot move from the gel because the adherence uh, is, forces are too high. So they have to crawl on small sand grains and then they can actually um, lift the top of their body and stand on their tails and do this uh, waving movements. And if a fruit fly passes by here, it would pick up one of these nematodes and the nematode can then find the spiracles and enter into the, in the fly. <clears throat> so we tested um, the mulch previously here at Enema in Germany. Since we cannot work here with uh, fruit flies, we do not have a quarantine station we were checking the performance with uh, our house insect, which is the um, mealworm, the lesser mealworm, Tinipira molitor. Um, and we checked uh, different recipes for this uh, mulch formulation. It was containing either silver, so it was always containing water, obviously. <laughs> But uh, we also tried some uh, thickener, crystalline cellulose here. And we were thinking maybe we can uh, reduce the evaporation a bit by also adding rapeseed oil to this mulch formulation. Uh, and actually that was working. So we had uh, best performance of these mulch uh, with all these additives. Um, but it was no difference between uh, five minutes incubation of the weevils in the mulch or 30 minutes incubation. Um, anyway, uh, since this is not percentage mortality, but uh, that meal was out of 40, we were coming very close to 100% mortality. So 40 is about here. So there was, were just a few insects missing. Um, and that was even in, in the older uh, mulch formulation could be seen. Interestingly, in the younger mulch formulation, we, the performance was not quite as good, but even here we had about 50%, 75% efficacy. So we were quite um, optimistic about this method. And we then sent the mulch formulation to Greece so it could be tested um, for uh, the efficacy against adult 
net flies. Um, yeah, this is the mealworms. You can see 20 means 50%. We always work with 40 mealworms. Um, you can see that there is uh, uh, already after five minutes uh, incubation quite a lot of mortality. Interestingly, it does not increase over time. So uh, uh, you do not reach all of them, which, yeah, it's a bit skeptic. So when we tested it on mad flies, um, the mulch was uh, applied as it as we had the idea to apply it. It was applied as a layer on the soil substrate, and then uh, the larvae were first put on the soil, and then um, uh, the, the larvae actually had to move through the layer two times. They had to move down and up again. Um, but unfortunately, there was no difference in the adult flies emerged in control versus mulch. So um, the efficacy against the mad flies was much lower. However, we did see an effect on the uh, longevity of the emerging mad flies. And see it here, uh, the survival function, the red curve is the survival of the treated mad flies and they have survived shorter than the untreated. Well, not enough probably for a field application, but we wanted to know um, uh, whether with the higher concentration of this um, um, mulch, we would have better effects. So we directly emerged the pupa into the mulch and then saw whether the, uh, the em emerging flies would be infected. And here, um, we actually had a significant difference in the adult flies emerged uh, from the control versus the mulch treatment. And again, the emerging flies, which was not that immediately like this person, uh, were dying much quicker. So apparently they, they are actually uh, quite resistant to the nematodes. They can survive with nematodes inside for quite a long time, but they are eventually also killed. Um, but any, the, the, the problem here is um, we can, in the field, not emerge the pupa directly into the mulch uh, because uh, the nematode dose would be much too high. So we decided within the project to uh, um, well, cancel this idea. To, uh, so we, we were not working with the mulch formulation in the field because they would not be payable, commercially viable. Uh, when we tested the nematodes uh, in the lab, we screened different species. And um, to make it short, we found that Sandima feltia is the most infective species um, in the laboratory. The emerging flies here uh, were much lower um, when the nematodes were uh, freshly in the substrate. But even if we added the uh, larva later on, there was a residual infectivity of the nematodes in the substrate for two and four weeks. So um, in, in conclusion, the cumulative uh, mortality of the mad flies was 50% at 20 degrees. And we have a residual activity of the nematodes in the substrate for four weeks. And all the nematode species significantly reduce the larva inside the fruits as well, which uh, was a very important finding because uh, the larva seemed to stay in the larval stage in the winter in the fruits um, for a long, long time. Whereas in the summer, the larva immediately turned to the pupa. And the pupa are not um, susceptible to nematodes. The surface of the pupa provides no entry points for the nematodes and it's too hard for them to be penetrated directly. So it's a very big advantage that we, that the uh, mad flies has this habit to um, live as a larva in the larva stage in the fruits during the winter. No, no big difference between the species here in the 
um, infection of larvae inside the fruits. In terms of temperature, asphalt here is the most suitable for the winter time because those two species, they have troubles to infect insects at temperatures below 15 degrees. Um, there's another species which can uh, actually infect below 15 degrees, which is heterotitis downsy. So we also uh, produced this, especially for this project and had it checked, but the performance of heterotitis downsy was not better than Sanonima feltier. So we, we were sticking to Sanonima feltier for the field trials. <clears throat> And the final dose we came up with was 150 and 250 nematodes per square centimeter. And that dose was then transferred to the field, basically. Yeah, that, that was the most successful at 15 and at 20 deg 25 degrees. Um, so in the treatment early season is um, spring season. Um, two orange types were treated, nettle oranges and sour oranges uh, in March, end of March. And the dose was as stated before, we expressed in IJs per square meter, <clears throat> 1.5 million or 2.5 million infective juveniles per square meter and half a liter per square meter. The fallen fruits were equally distributed between treated and untreated um, parts of one tree. And um, so there were a total of about 50 trees and 49 trees treated. And uh, for every tree, half of the area was left untreated and half of the area was treated. And then after the treatment, cages were erected and flies were counting three times over a period of seven weeks to see whether there were differences in the number of emerging flies. <clears throat> Those are the results of this field trial. Um, that it was differentiated by the uh, tree type. Um, the sour oranges gave these results. Uh, the cumulative uh, number of adult net flies emerging was higher in the control than in the nematode treatment, significantly higher actually in all cases not just in the sour oranges, but also in the case when the nettle oranges were um, taken together with the others, uh, we had a significant reduction of the emerging fruit flies. <clears throat> um, there was no significant difference actually between the two doses, which is good because uh, we can save quite a lot of money by moving to the lower dosage. So 1.5 million per square meter is a sufficient dose to control the med floods. <clears throat> Another trial was done in autumn in Corinthos um, uh, on Valencia oranges. So just one type of oranges in this case in October. So that would be also off season, but in autumn. Uh, with, uh, in this case, just the higher dose. Uh, for um, some reason, the lower dose was not tried. In this um, trial, it was probably, because it was the first trial done, um, the fear was that we, we would not be successful, so we did not include the, the smaller dose here. Um, Again, the fallen fruits were equally distributed between treated and untreated part and 50 trees were treated. Um, and each tree was divided in two sections, treated and untreated. The cages were erected a few days after uh, treating the areas and the flight counted um, during emergence. Here a bit, not quite as long as in the um, previous experiment, simply because the flies do not emerge in winter. They only they need a certain temperature. So until 22nd of November, the flies were counted. And again, there was a significant reduction of emerging flies um, by uh, the nematode treatment. Um, also, 
definitely above 50 percent. So in conclusion, um, the off-season treatment with nematodes does work. It's a suitable tool to control med flies off-season. We get approximately 60% reduction in fly emergence in the lab and in the field, which was very relieving that the field trials um, match even in terms of the magnitude of the control um, the lab trials. Uh, the application in spring or autumn is favorable because um, we have usually higher soil moisture there and the temperature is more suitable for Sonima Feltier. And um, well, there are other reasons why it's fav favorable because uh, the larva spent a longer time as in the larva stage. They're not, not uh, developing into pupa so quickly. <clears throat> um, if you look in the lab in the published papers, you will find a lot of papers um, on nematodes used against uh, Mediterranean fruit flies. But most of them actually they consider local nematode isolates um, and not commercially available isolates, which is a pity, but it's it's understandable because uh, usually this work is done by people working on entomogenic nematodes and it's quite easy to isolate your own isolates. And then, I mean, the scientists want to see what, what uh, are these isolates capable of. Uh, it's a pity because uh, to get these isolates into mass production is not an easy task. And since mass production is really Mass production is done by really big companies. Uh, they are not interested uh, in a very um, scattered range of different isolates to be produced. Um, to give you an idea, all over the world, there are now, I think, less than um, five, well, maybe six species of nematodes produced. And um, the isolates within each species, there are often only one because the, the companies, they, they copy from each other or they have just seen this one, this particular isolate is most suited for mass production while having also the, the best infectivity against a wide range of insects. So it was uh, a very, uh, it was our intention to work with commercial isolates here in this project to be able to recommend at the end uh, a method with um, isolate, with nematodes which are available commercially. Very important is that the larvae inside the fruits are infected. Um, the pupil stage is not infected and we had this uh, when we were working with cherry fruit flies in Germany. Uh, we've seen that the pupation is taking place so quickly that the nematodes hardly have a chance to control the larva. When the larvae come out of the fallen fruits, they immediately come out after the fruit has fallen, and then it's just a few hours before the pupil stage is formed, and then the nematodes have no chance infecting. But the mat fly, uh, especially in the winter, has a long time in the larva stage inside the fruits, and that's a good entry point or a good area for nematode treatment. The project really showed that uh, the nematode treatment is a very robust method, method with similar results in spring and autumn. There will be another uh, trial evaluated, I think, soon. It has been done in spring in Greece. Um, the effect on the summer population of such an off-season control um, uh, with nematodes is obviously dependent on an area-wide treatment of, of infested hotspots in an orchard area. So it, it requires a lot of knowledge about the, the hotspots uh, which are which need to be treated to stop the buildup of populations. With that, I think I'm done. And I want to thank you with this nice picture, not from an orchard, but from 
the area where I come from, we grow a lot of oilseed rape. And you see here some parasitic wasps, which are after the pollen beetle in the flowers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm checking uh, the Q&A if we have uh, something from uh, our uh, participants. I, I don't see anything for now. If you want to share your thoughts or any questions, now is the time, please. <laughs> well, Arne, thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, presentation and the introduction also to the industrial part of uh, producing the nematodes, which is uh, quite uh, interesting and challenging. I have actually a question. So um, how you think like a company um, of the future of the um, management with endomopathogenic nematodes, with all your developments, you see like this is gonna increase or what are the challenges that you will face considering also the European policy for a reduction of uh, pesticide uh, use and uh, for achieving these uh, goals of the Green Deal? Um, yeah, well, uh, I think there's a great future for using nematodes. Um, although I must say that uh, we were a bit blinded by the past because we were mostly applying nematodes in niche markets, in high value crops. And there we did not really uh, encounter the chemical industry so much as we do now uh, while we are entering broad acre markets like corn, for instance. We, we feel a strong um, resistance, let's say, from uh, the agriculture and also even from the government, which is probably steered by the chemical industry to adopt the method, despite the, the European um, guidelines to replace uh, chemical methods if biological methods are available, it's happening very, very slowly. Uh, and this is especially true for um, well, commercially interesting crops or, or for crops which are commercially interesting for the large um, companies. That's something which we underestimated, or I at least underestimated. So, um, but the the whole um, uh, business of biocontrol is growing, and so we are also starting to organize ourselves and make our own lobby work. <laughs> okay, I've seen actually some uh, questions coming in. So, yeah. Uh, the first is that from uh, Sajjad Mir, that uh, it first it's very nice presentation. I appreciate the presented for his comprehensive work. Is it possible to get 60% reduction in laboratory and field conditions? And this is the question. Um, yeah, it was possible in, in these trials. I mean, def definitely this, this work was uh, very carefully done. Um, and the doses were directly transferred from the lab to the field. Uh, and usually what happens uh, is that you get a lower efficacy in the field because obviously the, the soil layer in the field is much uh, higher. And it's much, much deeper as in the lab trials. But in, in these trials, we got exactly 60% and that was the, almost exactly what we also got in, in the lab. It will be difficult to, to get any higher, uh, which is uh, evident by the fact that we did not see any dose effect. We did not see any difference between um, the almost double dose of 2.5 million per square meter compared to the 1.5 million. So 60% seems to be the limit. We are not going to reach um, 90 or 100%. Yeah, but, there is yeah. A, another follow-up question, actually, regarding whether pupil tephritid fruit flies are infected by nematodes. I think you have commented already on this. But yeah, unfortunately not. The, the pupil, although in some papers you, you find um, the statement that the pupil are infected, 
what I believe is what happened there is that probably um, the, the some of the pupa were not really in the pupa stage yet. Um, the pupa are not infected, but you can obviously find pupa with nematodes inside uh, because if they are infected in the very, very late larva stage, they will be alive, they will produce pupa. And um, what you then find is uh, pupa with filled with nematodes, and the nematodes have a lot of troubles to get out of the pupa again because the, the um, well, skin of the pupa is so dense. So also there is a, a, a question of uh, Costa Zarpas uh, from our group here in the University of Thessaly. Uh, Costa mentioned that we have applied the 2.5 million nematodes and whether the 1.5 million is sufficient for off-season dose. So again, you have commented, but I, we would yeah. like to have your opinion on this. Well, the, the 1.5 million, there was no difference to the 2.5 million in the one trial where these two doses were compared. So from these results, um, 1.5 million is by far sufficient. We have not, we don't know whether we see a dose effect um, or at which concentration we would see a dose effect, but between these two, we didn't see, maybe we can even go lower, but. 1.5 million is the recommendation now. Mm -hmm. uh, th this uh, actually uh, triggers me to ask about the cost of the, of, of the operation, because it seems that uh, nematodes are quite costly. And uh, do you think that uh, in the future, the prices can uh, become lower, so can be adopted more uh, widely by growers? Yeah, uh, the, the, price, the nematodes are costly, that's right. And um, to be honest, in most uh, applications, we actually apply an even lower dose of 500 million per square meter um, to, to be able to, for the grower to pay the nematodes. And maybe we can go even lower for the fruit fly. So that's one way of reducing the cost for nematodes. Another um, thing which is happening is uh, the, with the increasing size of the production, the prices for nematodes are continuously dropping as well, yeah. Good, and I've seen uh, uh, another question from uh, Apostolos Kapranas, uh, who was yeah. part of the development. <laughs> oh, very good, yeah. <laughs> hello, Apostolos. <laughs> Apostolos says, hello, Arne. Well, he's, he's done most of the work, uh, so my regards and my sincere thanks to the very good and precise work of Apostolos on the lab trials so, uh, and also on the field trials. Apostolos is asking if there is a very effective strain found in uh, Mediterranean that acts on much lower dose and there is market demand, then you think it is it would be still impossible to bring this to mass production. So that's... Uh, okay. Well, uh, no, not, not really, it, it's not impossible. If the market is sufficiently big, uh, you will find a company who um, does the production. We recently um, started the production of this heteropetus downsy because we thought we need something for the winter season and against wine weevils. Uh, and so we, and that's still a very small market, but um, we, we did start the production. And it's absolutely thinkable if the advantages uh, of another isolate are very, very pronounced that, and, and if the market is sufficiently high that the production is uh, taken up. Good. Yeah. And I've seen actually probably the last question here is uh, which juvenile juvenile stage of nematode is most effective against which instar of the maggot. So we have okay. clarified that uh, the nematodes are not effective on the pupae, but they are yes. on, the, on the maggot. So that's... Uh, yeah, they are on the, uh, um, effective on the maggot. And it's actually an important question because uh, the maggot size is also um, uh, affecting the uh, infectivity of the nematodes. The large, the late instars of the maggots seem to be more susceptible to nematodes. 
which is it's not like this with all insects. Um, it seems to be a matter of the size. So I've seen that with other insects, very very small larvae are uh, less susceptible than uh, larger larvae. In terms of the juvenile stage of the nematode, um, there's only one stage which is, which is infective, that's the dower juvenile stage, the, or we call it infective juvenile stage. It's a specialized um, stage of the nematode, which does not take up any nourishment, lives on uh, lipid reserves, but has this behavior of looking for insects and penetrating into insects. And it's the only free living stage which is available. And it's only the, this stage which we can uh, formulate and sell. Yeah, others cannot be sold. Good, good, thank you very much. There is also a comment of uh, uh, Mamohan Kumar. Uh, it's like a, a awesome, uh, awesome presentation and nice work by the doctor. So. That's the final comment I think we have. Thank you. <laughs> so um, uh, with, with this, uh, before uh, uh, Georgia's uh, last uh, words, uh, Arne, I would like to thank you very much. I think uh, we have uh, learned a lot today and we have seen that uh, with all this development, we can uh, definitely have an additional um, tool to target uh, Med fly off season and probably other food flies. And uh, apparently, this is uh, a component of a system. And we are really glad that uh, this uh, has been developed. And also, I've seen that uh, the future of nematodes with all the new formulations, the endomopathogenic nematodes, uh, is uh, quite, uh, quite good. So, thank you very much. So, yeah. something for uh, uh, people attending. It's uh, this is a series of webinars and uh, we have already planned the, the next one. So stay tuned. We have uh, more developments of our project as we are uh, heading to the completion of the project. We have uh, much more to report. So thank you very much, Arna. Yeah, bye. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peters. Thank you, of course, uh, Professor Papadopoulos. Thank all of you for joining us uh, today for this insightful uh, webinar. I believe the same uh, as well. We appreciate your active participation through the Q&A and your engagement throughout this uh, session. Uh, we hope that the information shared and the discussion held have been valuable to you. As we conclude, as Professor Papadopoulos mentioned, we encourage you to continue exploring uh, for updates via our social media and our web page uh, related to our project because we will announce uh, and uh, as we want to have uh, more connection with you through another webinar and, of course, an event that we will uh, announce quite soon. Thank you very much. We will be in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Georgia.